Good evening. Morning. <laughs> I do this the night before, you know. Welcome to worship for the fourth Sunday in Lent, our preaching and prayer service. Hope that you and yours are doing well as we move towards spring. And so uh, let's just begin. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace, amen. And so we acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and for God's mercy. Please let's take a couple of deep breaths to clear our uh, hearts and, and minds. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt through though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow your way of life. Amen. Here's the good news. God loved the world so that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. His promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in Spirit's power. Amen. So the mercy of God, the peace of Christ, and forgiveness in Spirit are always with you, and also with you. Holy God, hear our prayer. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us by your gracious life and death for us. Bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your Spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So our first reading, uh, part of which I'll, uh, or I'll be thinking of it in my message today, is from 1 Samuel in the 16th chapter. The Lord said to Samuel, How long do you intend to mourn for Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with olive oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse in Bethlehem, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Samuel replied, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you should do. You will anoint for me the one I point out to you. Samuel did what the Lord told him. When he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the city were afraid to meet him. They said, Do you come in peace? He replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. So he consecrated created Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel noticed Eliab and said to himself, Surely here before the Lord stands his chosen king. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't be impressed by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God does not view things the way people do. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse presented Shammah. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Is that all the young men? Jesse replied, There is still the youngest one, but he's taking care of the flock. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. So Jesse had him brought in. Now he was ruddy, with attractive eyes and a handsome appearance. The Lord said, Go and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn full of olive oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day onward. Then Samuel got up and went to Ramah. This is the word of God, word of life. Our next reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the fifth chapter, where Paul writes, Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. 
live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of God, word of life. And now we read just a portion of the chapter uh, that is usually our reading in the three-year lectionary. This is the Holy Gospel as the word was given to John in the ninth chapter. Jesus had heard, about, heard that the Jewish leaders had thrown him out, so he found the man whom he'd healed of blindness and said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man replied, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus told him, You have seen him. He is the one speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that those who do not see may gain their sight, and the ones who see may become blind. This is the good news of Christ's victory. So let's sing uh, Christ the Life of All the Living. Uh, the computer only has a melody line, and I can sing the melody line, so if you would please join me as we sing Christ the Life of All the Living. Okay. Christ, the life of all the living, Christ, the death of death, our foe, Christ, yourself for me once giving to the darkest depths of woe, through your suffering, death, and merit, life eternal I inherit. Thousand, thousand thanks are due, dearest Jesus, unto you. You have suffered great affliction, and have borne it patiently, even death by crucifixion, fully to atone for me. For you chose to be tormented, that my doom should be prevented. Thousand, thousand thanks are due, dearest Jesus, unto you. Then for all that bought my pardon, for the sorrows deep and sore, for the anguish in the garden, I will thank you evermore. Thank you for the groaning, sighing, for the bleeding and the dying, for that last triumphant cry, praise you evermore on high. <clears throat> Standing apart. Well, tomorrow, Monday, Ruth Depol turns 99 years old. Amazing. We're certainly going to celebrate her. And so it occurred to me that a song came out in 1934 when Ruth and my parents, Marge and Jerry, were about 10 years old, 1934. And it is a song that could well be written today but just like its composer, Cole Porter laments, writing is not what it used to be, especially in pop music. Oh, yeah. So it goes like this. In olden days, a glimpse of stockings was looked on as something shocking. Now heaven knows anything goes. Good authors, too, who once knew better words, now only use for letter words. Writing prose, anything goes. I started singing it, but... I don't know this next part that well. The world has gone mad today, and good's bad today, and black's white today, and day's night today, when most guys today that women prize today are just silly gigolos. Anything goes. Oh, so it's just like the wise old cynic Ecclesiastes would say, everything that is going on now has happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. 
Now, I don't think that it is all that helpful to lament that things are so very bad. We all know this, and after all, complaining will only get us so far anyway, as we learned last week from the Israelites, moaning the lack of water, not trusting in Moses or God's power. Now, of course, I would be lying if I thought that everything was going to plan, that things will all work out as we would hope. When I speak with the voice of faith, I do know that God will reverse all the wrongs that we have done to each other and to the planet we live on. But as you well know, I, I watch too much news to feel very confident about our faith. So if we don't wish to be skeptical, how shall we think about our history or our fate? What should we do about it? Can we do anything about it? Paul wrote, once you lived in darkness, but now you are in light. Did you light a candle? Did I invite, invent the light bulb? Could we ever cause the sun to shine on us and us alone, all on our lonesome? Now, I could say this in any sermon I were to give, that it is God who can make any and all things good. That doesn't mean that we should think that all people are evil and corruptible. For we know that God does all this for us unconditionally because of God's great love for us. We may earn a paycheck, but we cannot pay for our salvation. In the parable, Abraham in heaven told the rich man over there in hell, <laughs> so you had all the good stuff in your life while Lazarus suffered at your doorstep. Now he is in paradise and you are in agony. Now if it is true that we who believe have never really been on a straight path, in a, in a different way we could say that God doesn't always choose a straight line either. Jacob, after all, was the second son of Isaac. Though Aaron was served as the high priest, it was the younger Moses who became the leader of the people of Israel. Today's selection process for the next king of God's people turns out to be the youngest, David, the shepherd. Now, even though we have a positive view of the many shepherds who are a part of our scriptures, we can read into this story that the youngest son had to do the least favorite work of their household. All these other brothers seem to Samuel to be perfectly good choices to serve as king, but God had another idea. Yes, we hear plenty of good things about David, that he was handsome and had a sparkle in his eyes. He would win more battles than all the other commanders, including taking down a giant with a rock. And his harp playing and his singing would soothe the savage beast that was that angry King Saul. Now, David's story sounds much like any other legend of the kings of old in any nation, except that the author of Samuel's two volumes does not shy away from the sin of sending Uriah to his death so that David could keep his wife Bathsheba for himself. But David does learn. He accepts his punishment. We fall short, but we can be restored. We know a God of love, grace, and mercy. Well, let's be grateful then that God doesn't make the obvious choices. If that were so, what hope have we? Yet any of us who loves another knows how we must be forgiving if, if we ever hope to be forgiven. It's what we say in the Our Father. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's what Jesus taught in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the more merciful, for they will receive mercy. Or elsewhere in that same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? The stakes are high, he says. The way you treat others is the way you will be treated. 
Now this may well sound like a this for that proposal, much like the golden rule, which we heard kind of a variation on just there. Golden rule, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. But let me put a frame around this using a given statement, uh, like we used to use back in geometry. I think it was geometry. We'd say something like, given this fact, these things will follow. When we confess the Nicene Creed, we are stating a lot of givens which we believe. We confess the main thing that helps us understand why we obey God's commands and, and follow what Jesus wants us to do as disciples. It is what Jesus did for us first of all. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried on the third day he rose again. It was for our sake that Jesus died on the cross. Since we cannot forgive ourselves of our own sins, that is what God does. The cross then becomes the lens by which we see how we can obey. It's not as though we could ever pay God back. We'll obey in gratitude for God's grace. It's what I've learned that can be called a radical obedience. And I think I've used that word before in sermons, that idea. Even with Jesus' central command, love one another as I've loved you, another statement of Jesus makes such rules more expansive and selfless. In Luke 6, he says, Love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Let's be kind, simply because it is good to do so. Others may think us pushovers, that a corrupt person could easily take advantage of us, or that we find how people are just not as considerate as we are. Well, that's their problem. Bless those who curse you. You know, that actually happened to me this past week. A, de a delivery van at my house had blocked some guy's truck from getting by, and we all got an earful. But I still said, out of nowhere, God loves you. Needless to say, his response was still NSFW, not suitable for work. <laughs> so Samuel thought it was staring him in the face. A first son of Jesse who could be king. Sorry, says God, but it, it's not him. Or or the next six brothers in line, God says, God does not view things the way people do. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. <laughs> when that is the given, that God knows us and still loves us, then there is a very powerful love happening here. Don't we then want to stand in that light which is holy love? Will we do what is good because we want to make a difference in the world, to love and serve our neighbor and even our enemy, because that's how darkness and evil is defeated. It is as clear as ever that the world needs believers who trust that God's love will overcome the powers of this world that attack us all. Now, as I hark back to songs of your youth, perhaps. There's one from my younger days that I will listen to from my list of what I call angry, angry music. <laughs> and yet there are several songs of hope with which I try to finish my music therapy session. The artist, Ben Harper, sings, What good is a man who won't take a stand? What good is a cynic with no better plan? I believe in a better way. Reality is sharp. It cuts at me like a knife. Everyone I know is in the fight of their life, and I believe there's a better way. Take your face out of your hands and clear your eyes. You have a right to your dream, and don't be denied. 
I believe in a better way. Amen. And so the church prays. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creating God by your word, you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Protect all who are harmed by severe weather. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the, works of, guide the work of heads of state and elected officials, especially President Zelensky. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick and comfort those who grieve. Bless all harmed by gun violence and prejudice for women and families, for immigrants and refugees. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and our community. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We especially pray for Lori, Frank, John, Beth, Sandy, Mark, for our homebound members, for all those that we call to mind in our hearts, for other situations in the world that are, are so hard for us to get our heads around. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of history, with thanksgiving, we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for your people, like Joseph, the guardian of Jesus. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. And so we pray for our daily bread, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, Excuse me, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so, in thanksgiving for the ways that we have supported our church, our neighbors, that uh, we do this work so that, as I said, others are helped. We are a church for others. And so, let us pray for those gifts that we give for the sake of the world around us. God of good gifts, receive our gifts and offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. So receive the blessing. The Holy Three, the Holy One, increase your hope, strengthen your faith, deepen your love, and grant you peace. Amen. And the peace of Christ is always always goes with you, and also with you. Please uh, share that peace with those in your household, those of us who've gathered online for the service, and uh, hope you have a blessed day as we get towards spring. Bye.